Okay, it's time. We'll go ahead and get started in our class now. Appreciate everybody being here this morning. And uh, Brother Conrad had a, some problems here. And diabetes, his uh, sugar level, I think, had dropped, but everything seems to be okay now. So we're grateful for that. But uh, we're here in the last chapter now of Hebrews, chapter 13, and really just down to verse 3. And uh, we've already looked at most of this in verse 3, but I want to begin just reading that. That verse itself, taking this verse by verse, uh, remember the prisoners as if chained with them and those who are mistreated, uh, since you yourselves are also in the body. Uh, So we we talked about this first part of it, uh, the fact that remember the prisoners. Uh, We have a responsibility, especially to those who are Christians that are in prison, but really to all of those who are in prison. And so he talks about remembering those in prison as if you were chained with them. And we discussed about that. You know, the idea that if you can put yourself in their shoes to imagine what it's like for them being in prison, uh, then that would be a greater encouragement to you to do whatever you can to encourage and help them while they're in prison, especially uh, those that are fellow Christians. Uh, That can be a discouraging thing to them, maybe to, to hinder their faith or to Uh, to damage or even destroy their faith. And so we need to do everything we can to encourage and help them in times like that. But then also he mentions this last thing we have not talked about, and that is, he says, since you yourselves are in the body also. Uh, So as we stop to think about that passage, that being in the body also, uh, when we talk about the body, what are we talking about here? The church, that's the first thing that comes to mind, that you'd be talking about the the body of Christ, the church. Uh, so that's, that's the idea about it. There's several passages in the Bible that indicate that. I, I think I've got just a couple of them down here in regard to that about the church. Uh, well, maybe I didn't. But if you have your Bibles, let's look over there at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, and verse 25. And if someone else will turn to Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 22 and 23. 1 Corinthians 12, 25. And then Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23. Who's got that passage in 1 Corinthians for us? Brother Darnell, please read that. That there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Now here you're talking about the body and the members needing to have the same care for one another. Well, remember those who are in prison uh, as, you know, the fact that you're in the same body also. Uh, You have to have special concern for them. Now, it's emphasized even more here in the next passage about what that body is in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Uh, does anyone have that passage? Uh, no, chapter 1 of Ephesians, verses 22 and 23. Okay, please, Russ. Okay, so there it talks about the church being the body of Christ. And so many, you know, and when they read this passage here in Hebrews chapter 13, as if in the, you know, you're in the same body also, they're talking about maybe those who are Christians who are in the church. That's one possibility. But there's also the possibility here that what he's talking about is the physical body. Uh, And and the reason behind that is, uh, it's been expressed by uh, Brother Lightfoot, remember that as long as you're in this physical body, you're subject to similar treatment. You know, one of the reasons why you need to remember those who are in prison as being chained with them, because really, as long as you're in this physical body, the same thing could happen to you. Uh, there was that uh, persecution that began with the church, and every Christian uh, would be aware of that fact. Hey, uh, I might be the next one that's, uh, that's taken and imprisoned. Uh, there's that possibility. And as I look through the, the various uh, individuals writing about this, brothers Lightfoot, Milligan, and Kaufman uh, either held firmly to the view that it's talking about the physical body or else they were leaning in that direction. Now, only one, uh, Brother Martel Pace, seemed to feel, feel that it was talking about uh, the spiritual body, the church. 
And so one or the other, whichever it be, you know, it would be something to be an encouragement to us to remember these individuals. Remember them because they're also in the body. You're in the same body they are. You're brothers and sisters in Christ, and so you need to remember them. Or remember them because you're in that physical body, and you're subject to the same treatment that they have received. And it could happen to you. And realize that it could happen to you ought to cause you to be more sympathetic toward those people. And be grateful and thankful to God that you're not in that situation. But being out of prison, you ought to be in a position where you can do things to help encourage those who have been in prison. So we want to be able to keep that in mind. So it may be speaking simply about the physical body. Now, when we get to this next section, verses 4 through 6, and really all of this is, is part of the same section, but in 4 through 6, he's going to deal with some general obligations that we have as Christians. The obligations we have to one another and how we live our life. And so as we look at that, uh, chapter 13, verses 4 through 6, uh, the text tells us marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And so we begin looking at the, at the general obligations given. Number one, he talks about the prospect here of marriage. That marriage, he says, is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. Marriage is more than just a piece of paper. It's, it's more than a certificate you have showing that you're married. Uh, most people that I know that are married have their a marriage certificate frame, maybe hanging up in their house somewhere as a reminder of them. But, but marriage is more than that. Marriage is a holy union ordained by God. And, and that's why God, you know, has, has given instructions to people in regard to that, that uh, what God has joined together, let man not what? Let, let not man put it asunder. Don't divide that. Uh, marriage is something that's honorable. And because of that, we need to respect marriage and what God has told us about that. Uh, it's not just a piece of paper. Uh, any breakdown in the family is something that's going to affect all society. Uh, so many times I hear people today talk about different things, and they say, well, that, that only affects me. Uh, and so, you know, I don't have to be concerned about what I'm doing. Uh, it, it's my choice, and if it affects me, it affects me, and I'm willing to accept that. But this is one of those things that doesn't just affect you as an individual. It has a tremendous effect over all the family. And that in turn can have an effect over society itself. Uh, Sometimes when we talk about marriage, we say that marriage is the building block of society. And so it is something of great importance. And that's why we've got to respect, we've got to honor uh, marriage as being a union that God has given to us, and because of that, we need to be careful that we not do anything that would destroy that union. We certainly want to, do not want to uh, cause that to, to be, uh, cause division uh, in the marriage. Matthew 19, 6, Jesus says, So then you are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Uh, God is opposed uh, to divorce in marriage. Uh, I think I've told this before, but uh, it's been several years back now. I was listening to Dr. Laura on radio. I don't know that she's still on anywhere. But uh, she was a Jewish lady, uh, very, very strong in her beliefs, you know, there in, in God's Word in the Old Testament. Uh, and she strongly uh, defended uh, children. Uh, and, and everything about marriage, she says, it centers around the children you have, and you've got to be concerned about them. But on one occasion, she had a caller call in, and, and people would call in with different problems and get her advice on these things. And, and one lady called in and was having troubles in her marriage, and, and nothing seemed to be working out right. And uh, she had had some friends advise her that, that the best thing you could do is get out of that marriage. You need to file for divorce. And she says, I thought about that, but she says, uh, I, I realize that, that, that that's not something God likes, that God hates divorce. And Dr. Laura kind of exploded at her. She said, where in the world do you get this idea that God hates divorce? 
You know, so that simply is not true. Don't let people tell you that. And the woman said, well, I, I don't know. That's what I've been told. Uh, she didn't know if that was true or not. And uh, so the show went on. And some while later in the show, another person called in. And he was a minister for the Church of Christ. And he said, uh, I just wanted to inform you. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16 is where God says he hates divorce. And, and Dr. Laura was shocked by that. So you had to get her Bible out and look it up and see. And, and when she saw that, she admitted. She said, I never knew that. So I had no idea that was behind it. But there it is, Malachi 2, verses 15 and 16. Uh, God says to Malachi, But did not he, that is God, make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. God warning his people, don't deal treacherously with that bride of your youth. Uh, to divorce that, that individual, he says, uh, what it does to you is to cover your garment with violence. Uh, God hates it, he says. And so we need to be careful that we not do anything uh, to bring about a division uh, in that marriage. Uh, we've got to avoid that. And so as he goes on from that then and, and talks about the maintaining of that union and how important that is. Uh, God wants us in our marriages to be one and remain as one. And yet we're living in a society today where... Many people don't think anything at all about divorce. Uh, the rate of divorce is increasing, increasing more and more. And so it's getting close to being the same level as marriage. As many people are being married, almost as many are being divorced. And that's hard to believe in our world today. But that is something that the Bible emphasizes over and over again, that we need to maintain that union. To obey this command may also be brought under this general heading of brotherly love. That's where it began here in chapter 13, when he said, let brotherly love continue. Uh, if we have that true brotherly love for one another as we should, uh, we need to realize that under that also would be this idea of keeping the union in marriage. And there are several things that, that could be said about that uh, in, in regard to it. Uh, but he points out here, that fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Uh, what's the difference between fornication and adultery? What's that? Okay. Uh, adultery in, involves uh, where an individual is married. And they're not being faithful to their spouse. They've involved themselves sexually with someone else. Uh, the other word, fornicator, of the word pornea, uh, is a word that's more general and broad in its use. And has reference to any illicit uh, sexual activity by a person. Uh, that would include homosexuality, certainly involved in any kind of action like that. Uh, I guess one way to, to try to keep it in mind is that... Uh, all adultery is fornication, but not all fornication is adultery. Uh, but both of them, though there is a distinction made in the words, what's the difference between the two in regard to the judgment of God? There is no difference. God will judge both the fornicator and the adulterer. And so anybody that's involved in illicit sexual relationships is going to come under the judgment of God. And you may escape the judgment of men. In fact, uh, in our society today, there, there may be people who will applaud you, uh, you know, that, because they think that's fine, whatever you want to do uh, is okay. But while you may escape the judgment of, of men, you're not going to be able to escape the judgment of God. That's something that is a surety. God will judge both of those together. And so we need to be aware of that and keep that in mind. Well, we talked about both of those. So let your con conduct, he continues, be without covetousness. Now, 
initially that may seem strange. Now he's gone from talking about marriage, being honorable, and keeping that union, uh, not destroying that marriage, not being divorced, uh, not being guilty of adultery or fornication. And then he turns right around to talk about covetousness. But it, it's not really such a strange stretch between those two. And there, there are several times in the Bible when, when the Bible talks about this. Uh, someone turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verses 3 through 6, uh, to be looking at that verse for us. When he talks about that, about avoiding sexual sin, he mentions, do not defraud your brother. And there's the idea, I believe, where, where it gets to that point of coveting your neighbor's wife. Now that's, that's commandment number 10, isn't it? That God gave in, in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, and he goes on, puts it out. You don't covet anything that your neighbor has. <clears throat> You're not to have that, that illicit desire for someone's wife. And so when Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica and talks to them about these things, he includes in there defrauding your brother. Uh, for a man uh, to take someone else's wife, to be involved with her uh, illicitly like that, that is a covetousness. Uh, I guess maybe we should have started off, when we talk about covetousness, what is covetousness itself? Okay, an, an unlawful desire that a person has. And it, it can uh, apply to just about anything. Uh, that's the idea of it. Uh, it can refer to illicit sexual desires, as we talked about. There, there's several other passages on that. But in this instance here, it's speaking specifically about coveting money. And, and I know that simply because of the word that's used here, the Greek word. Uh, let me just mention this word here. Aphelopogoros. Uh, it's a compound word. Really, there's three parts to it. But if you notice that, that second part, phila, P-H-I-L-A, phila. You know, we just got through talking about brotherly love. And uh, brotherly love is what word? Philadelphia. Phila, from the Greek word philos, uh, a love that you would have for a friend, uh, and then Adelphos, brother. Well, you've got that same word phila here again also, but here it's talking about phila guros, love of money. And then it has the alpha before it, which negates it. And so without love of money, that's literally what he's talking about here. That, that we are to be without the love of money. That's the covetousness he's talking about here. That unlawful desire for it. Uh, and again, again, there, there are warnings given to us in the Bible about that. Matthew 6, 24. Jesus here on the Sermon on the Mount says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, what's mammon? Money. Wealth. Uh, you can't serve both God and wealth. And if a person is coveting money, and that's his desire in life, uh, then he's not going to be able to serve God as he should. Uh, Luke twelve fifteen, And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Jesus, again, is warning his disciples about this idea of covetousness. Uh, and especially here again, talking about coveting material things, con coveting wealth or money. Because he says, take heed and beware of covetous, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. 
Right, that's one we just looked at before this. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't do that. It would be possible. Now, I came across this quote uh, that I thought was interesting. Uh, F.F. F. Bruce said, We forget this warning, the warning that Jesus gives here, that one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Bruce says, We forget this warning every time we ask how much a man is worth, when we really mean how much does he own. What, what is any individual worth? In the eyes of God, of what worth are you? The whole world. You know, the, the soul of any individual is worth more than the whole world. The value of a person. You're valuable to God because you're an, you have an eternal soul created in the image of God. Uh, and that's the value. But most time we talk about somebody, what's he worth? What we mean by that is, how much money does he have? What all does he possess? But Jesus says you need to understand, remember this, in regard to this covenant, that a person's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possess. That's not what determines your worth in the eyes of God. And we need to remember that and be careful about that. Uh, Paul uh, had talked about this. He talked about, he says that no uh, drunkard, nor violent, but gentle, but cor not quarrelsome, and no lover of money. That's when he's talking about the qualifications for being an elder. And, and, and I picked that particular verse there, chapter 3, and verse 3 of 1 Timothy, because the last thing it says was no lover of money. That word is only found twice in the Greek New Testament. It's found here in Hebrews chapter 13, uh, when he talks about not being a lover of money. And it's the same word that's used when God talks about qualifications for being an elder. If you want to be an elder, you can't be someone who's a lover of money. And so we've got to avoid that covetousness. And then in regard to that, he says, be content with such things as you have. Now, the reality is that the very opposite of covetousness is contentment. And, and there's so many passages in the Bible that talk about the need that we have to be content. And so the writer here says, be content with such things as you have. Now, uh, I think this is a real sign of spiritual maturity. When you have an individual who's content with what he has. Now, that's, that's not saying that you can't desire to improve yourself. But when you talk about this idea of covetousness, that's an individual who's not content with what he has. Uh, he's always desiring more. And we talk about covetous being evil desire. It's always wanting more. You never have enough. And that's one reason why they can never be satisfied in life. Several passages, 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. One of the sorrows that people have who are covetousness or who are coveting things, is the fact that they're never satisfied with what they've got. Uh, it's never enough to, to be able to do what they want to do or to possess what they want to possess. Plus, there's always that fear that they might lose what they've got. And so they're never satisfied. They worry about that. Uh, Paul earlier, in that same chapter, 1 Timothy, uh, really verses 6 through 8, there we go, says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. How many of you can say honestly, I'm content just having enough clothing to keep my body covered and having enough food to keep my body alive? You know, Paul was an individual who learned to be content uh, in any situation. Jesus had talked about it in Matthew 6, 31 and 33. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, he says, The Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Uh, God will help you. He'll provide for you the things that you need. Not necessarily all the things you want, 
but the things certainly that you need. And we shouldn't worry about all those things. But see, the, the covetous person is the one who does worry about it. And the opposite of that is contentment, not worrying about those things. Uh, Philippians 4.11, Paul says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. In the context there, uh, Paul is talking about the help that he's received financially, the support he's received from the church there at Philippi. He acknowledged the fact that from the beginning, they were the only congregation that supported him. Uh, and, and now some period of time has gone by, and Paul hasn't heard anything from them, hasn't received anything from them. And then at last, he mentions here in the letter, at last uh, that help from them comes. It may be they didn't know where Paul was or didn't know where to send it or maybe they didn't have anybody to take support to Paul or maybe they didn't have the support at that time to send to him. Uh, but finally, at last, it comes. And when Paul talks about it here, he says, I speak, he says, not in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Paul talks about I know what it's like to abound and I know what it's like to be abased. I know what it is to have a lot and I know what it's like to have a little but in reality, Paul said, it doesn't matter in which state I am, whether I've got a lot or I have nothing. He said, I've learned to be content. Uh, and like I said, I think that's, that's a sure sign of spiritual maturity when a person can live this life in contentment with whatever it is that he has. Uh, he's not worried and fretting, I've got to have more. He's not worried and fretting, I might lose what I've got. I'm not satisfied with whatever. He, he learns that contentment. Now, uh, It's just something I thought about this morning when I was looking over my notes again. Several years ago, I'd gone to pick up Sarah. Uh, this is when she was in high school, and she was over at a friend's house. Uh, and, and these people were members of the church, not here, but uh, another congregation. And so I went over to pick her up, and they invited me into the house. And uh, I mean, it was really a nice home. And one of the first things that I noticed in their house was a crown molding in the house. And it, it was huge crown molding throughout, you know. Now, I didn't even know what you call it at the time. I didn't know what crown molding was. I uh, had no idea about it. Never lived in a house that had crown molding. Uh, and I thought, boy, that's nice. I wouldn't mind having something like that. Well, the fifth house that Don and I lived in since we moved back to Birmingham is a house that has crown molding in it. Now, not anything like what they had, but it's crown molding. I thought, boy, this is nice. I have it in my den, I have it in the living room, and I have it in the master bedroom. I don't have it anywhere else, but I've got that crown molding. Sometime later, I was visiting uh, another family uh, and their home, and I noticed they had crown molding in the restroom. I came home. Now, I, I, I think I meant this as a joke, but that night... As Don and I were getting ready for bed, I told her, I says, I've noticed something about our house. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, we don't have any crown molding in our bathroom. <laughs> and I told her, I said, I'm thinking about doing a sermon on that. I'm thinking about doing a sermon on uh, covetousness. I don't know the points yet, but I've got the title. And the title is, there is no crown molding in my bathroom. <laughs> now that almost sounds silly, doesn't it? But I got to thinking about that. You know, I kind of did like the idea of having crown molding. I thought it really looked nice. Now I didn't, I didn't decide to go out and save up money and have crown molding put in my bathroom. I haven't done that. Don't plan on doing that. But still, it just I thought it affected me. I noticed it. I noticed something that somebody had in their house that I didn't have. You know, that's a problem sometimes. That's one time why we're not content. We see something that somebody else has got that maybe is a little bit better than what we've got. And we begin thinking, man, I'd like to have that. Uh, and that's not being content. And, and Paul says, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. And that's what we need to do. That's the way we need to, to progress in life, to come to that part in our life where we can be content with whatever it is that we have, whether it's a little or whether it's a lot. We need to be content with it. Now, again, here, here's another quote that I came upon that, that I thought really, really speaks to us about this. And that 
contentment, it's not merely being saying, okay, I'm, I'm satisfied with what I've got. But this individual pointed out that contentment springs from an intelligent trust in God and acceptance of His promises. It comes, he says, from an intelligent trust in God. And the promises that God has made to us. Now, when you look at the context here, and what God has promised to these people, let your conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There's one of the great promises God has made to us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, one individual, a, a, a Kenneth Weiss, uh, giving a, a paraphrase of this, put it this way. That God, he says, is saying to you, I will not. I will not. I will not let thee down, leave thee in the lurch, leave thee destitute, leave thee in straits and helplessness, abandon thee. God's promise, but I will not do that. I'm not going to leave you. When Jesus got ready to leave this earth, he told his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Uh, God is not going to abandon his children. So whatever happens to you in life, you know, if you have some kind of financial reversal, and, and all of a sudden you find you don't have that income you once had, uh, maybe you've got money invested in the stock market and, and there's problems there and it starts going down and you don't have that money you once had. You can still be content with the promise of God that I will not leave you. It doesn't matter what happens. You know that God is always there. He's always there to take care of you. Uh, it was pointed out uh, that, that this statement here in the Greek is, is he uses a double negative in regard to it. Uh, in, in English, double negatives are considered bad. You know, I've always been taught you don't use a double negative. But, that said that in the Greek language, the use of a double negative is just the way they have of emphasizing what's being said. And so this is just a way of emphasizing to us the promise that God's made, that He'll never leave us, He will not forsake us. It doesn't matter what happens to us in life. We can always know that God's with us. And because of that, look at what he says as a result of that. Verse 6, So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That's the second time I know here in the letter when he talks about we can do something boldly. You know, he talked about how we can come boldly before the throne of grace. And now here he says, We may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? You know, sometimes I thought, you know, I don't know. That seems, seems a little bit cocky uh, for me to see I will not fear. Uh, you know, well, I'm, you can say that without boasting in yourself. That's not really, it's boasting in God. It's boasting in what God has promised you. Remember, God is a God who cannot lie. And when he makes a promise, you know the certainty of it. Whatever he promises you, he will do. And so you can boast in that. Now you can boldly say, I will not fear. Why? No, because it says, God is my helper. Now, if God is your helper, what does that mean? What assurance does that give to you? Total. Sir? Total assurance. Total assurance. Can't fail. Uh, if God's there to help you, you know you're going to succeed. You've got someone that's there always. Now, there may be a lot of times when we might be abandoned by a family or by friends, but we know God's always with us. And it's because He's with us as our helper that we can be confident. Uh, David, you know, long ago, Psalms 23, talked about the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, and we can, we can proclaim that the Lord is our helper. Uh, and, I, and I like to emphasize in the word my, the Lord is my helper. Uh, I've talked about that before in regard to David talking about the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, it's one thing to say uh, the Lord is a helper. 
and another to say he's my helper. Uh, and the illustration I've used before is like uh, when some couple has a new baby. And the congregation here has been blessed. Uh, we've got a lot of babies. Uh, and when they come to church with that baby and everybody gathers around, ooh and ah and over that child, you know, and, and talking about how beautiful that child is and how wonderful, you know, and that's great. But see, there's only two people who can say, that's my child. And that makes all the difference in the world. And so when I can say that the Lord is my helper, not just a helper, but he's my helper, that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, that I can have then this confidence in God to say, you know, I'm not going to be afraid. Uh, what, what can man do to me? Well, you know, some people can very uh, sarcastically say, well, there's a lot that men can do to you. And that's true. There are a lot of things that can happen to you, things that men can do. Uh, Brother Martel Pace points out in his commentary, he says, we can be the victims of sarcasm, vilification, taunts, bitter words, or physical abuse. We can even be martyred as some have been in the past. That's what men can do to me. But what they can do to me physically is not the promise of God. God's talked about they're not going to be able to do anything to us spiritually. Uh, Paul, in writing to the church at Rome, in Romans chapter 8, said, you know, talked about this. Uh, if God is for us, what? Who can be against us? You know, and, and the question, the answer to that question is no one can. If God's for you, nobody. If God's my helper, there's no one that can destroy me, not spiritually. Uh, he's the one that can sustain me and that for all eternity, to be able to live with him forever and ever in heaven. That's the promise of God. And that's the reason we, we can say, I will not fear. Jesus said, fear not them that are able to destroy the body, but after that have no control over you. But rather fear him who's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. So I, I don't need to fear men because God's my helper. And he's going to see to it that I'm provided the help that I need. Now, if I want, I can make the decision myself. I can make the choice to leave God and not listen to him and not serve him. But if it's my desire and my will to serve God, and that's what I'm striving to do, God's there to help me and make sure I'm successful in it and to be able to have that with him forever in heaven. Okay, our time's gone. We have to end here at 10 after. We have about 20 minutes before our uh, worship hour at 1030. We appreciate you being here. And Lord willing, we'll begin at this same point next week uh, about the promises that God has made to us. Thank you very much.